and a um, wonderful introduction, and welcome to our session on the future of walking. And um, uh, I, d I don't know how many of you on, on your way in uh, to DLD this morning uh, noticed that we are actually uh, right opposite uh, the Museum of Transportation. Hands up. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, can you imagine a future where the only place where you can see a car is in a museum? Uh, so, this is a, so, we want to talk about... Uh, normally, when you have conference discussions about the future of urban mobility, people talk about self-driving vehicles or even uh, flying taxis, uh, a favorite subject here in Bavaria. Um, and we want to explore a very different uh, future of mobility in this discussion um, with these two uh, incredible experts. Uh, and we want to look at the future of a really ancient technology, uh, the technology of walking. And walking is uh, something that most of us take pretty much for granted uh, every day. We, we don't pay much attention to it. Um, but walking is something which is uh, at its very basic level, part of what makes us human. And uh, right here in Bavaria, but maybe um, less than 60 kilometers away from where we're sitting now, um, uh, just a couple of months ago, there was a discovery of uh, Udo. And Udo is the, the very first bipedal ape that has ever been discovered, um, and uh, from about 11 and a half million years ago. Uh, so. Being bipedal, walking on two legs, is something really special uh, uh, to humans. And it's interesting, in DLD, you may have seen that one of the, the guests here is Gary Kasparov, uh, who is an old uh, uh, hero of mine. And, um, but it, it's interesting to me that, um, uh, that you know, one used to think that the, the epitome of uh, machine intelligence was playing chess. But it turns out that it's actually much easier to beat a, a world champion chess player for a machine than to walk at the level of pretty much any four-year-old child. So walking turns out to be actually much more complex uh, than mo one might at first imagine. And I have here two really interesting people to explore uh, the importance and the future of walking um, who come at it from very different perspectives. So, we have a neuroscientist from Trinity College Dublin, um, another Dubliner, uh, somebody that I know from my own uh, past in Ireland, uh, Shane O'Mara. And Shane has just, as Steffi mentioned, uh, just published this incredible book, In Praise of Walking. Uh, and I believe there may be a couple of copies uh, uh, left in the bookshop, uh, the DLD bookshop, uh, signed personally by Shane. And um, it's actually just about to come out in German as well. And it's called uh, Das Glück des Gehens in, in German, uh, in a couple of months' time, I believe. And uh, so Shane is coming at this from the perspective of, of a neuroscientist, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then uh, we have Jeffrey Schnapp. So Jeffrey is uh, the founder of MetaLab at Harvard, but also a co-founder of Piaggio Fast Forward. Uh, Piaggio, many of you know from Vespas and scooters, and uh, Jeffrey has founded this innovation lab for Piaggio in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and is also a culture, cultural historian and former motorbike racer. <laughs> um, so has gone an interesting trajectory there <laughs> that we might dig into in a moment. Um, but first, maybe to, I, I'd like to start with Shane. Uh, and maybe Shane, so your previous book was about torture. How did you get from torture to walking? <laughs> Uh, so actually, the, the, uh, the journey is not so long. Uh, I'm very interested in the kind of the brain systems that support learning, memory, and cognition, and how they're affected by stress and depression. And the brain, is, as you might appreciate, is a kind of a jerry-rigged uh, device. Uh, certain brain regions serve multiple functions. So uh, the hippocampal formation, which is a part of the brain that supports memory, is very, very badly uh, affected by this kind of severe stresses that happen during torture, uh, but it's also the same part of the brain that's activated when we're navigating our world. And it, it, it's the location of the, quote, cognitive map in the brain. So that, that's how it is. 
Thanks. And, and Steffi was talking earlier when, in introducing us about the, you know, we, we, we all kind of check our steps per day and so on on, on these apps at, at the moment. Um, and we're all very conscious of the, the, the physical health benefits of walking more. Uh, I think there's a, a great increase in that consciousness, um, but you're particularly interested in how wa walking not only makes us physically healthy, but also affects our brain, our thinking, our creativity. Can you say a bit more about yeah. that, please? So, I, I, if we kind of step back and ask the question, why do we have a brain at all? Uh, animals that are sessile, or sorry, creatures or things that are sessile, like trees, don't have a brain. Um, but humans do, and motile species do. And the answer really has to lie in the, in the fact that we need a brain in order to get around in the world. In other words, the brain is there to serve motor functions. Um, rather than a, being a kind of a passive recipient of stuff that comes in, we process, and then we do something. The brain is active, it searches, it, it engages in prediction. And uh, we, we can see there are all sorts of wonderful stories from the animal kingdom that illustrate this. Uh, so the, one of the stories I tell is the story of the sea squirt. So the sea squirt, when, it's, when uh, it's in its larval stage, has a spinal cord. So it's in the same kind of phylum of animals that we are. Uh, it has an eye, uh, and it can tell up from down, and it swims. Uh, it avoids predation. But at a certain stage in its, in its life, what it does is uh, it turns itself over and, with its mouth, sticks itself to a rock. And it undergoes a really remarkable transformation of its body. But one of the first things it does when it sticks itself to the rock is absorb its own nervous system. In other words, it eats its own brain when it becomes an animal stuck in one place. Uh, whereas the medusa, the jellyfish, does the reverse journey. Uh, as a, a, a young animal, it remains stuck in one place as a polyp. And when it frees itself uh, from the rock that it's stuck to, one of the first things it has to do is evolve a nerve net. And it, it does this, again, because it must avoid predation, it must find sources of food, it must make pattern movements, it must be able to escape, it must be able to sting things in order to eat them, and then it must be able to ingest those things. So the, 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 kind of the larger lesson is there. You have a brain for movement, and this is the kind of the natural thing that, uh, that we should be doing, but it's also the thing that we have engineered out of our society. Uh, and the question is, why is that? Well, if, if you think about the kind of resource constraints that humans e existed under in, in Africa when we made that long walk uh, all those thousands of years ago, we lived in a resource-poor environment. So we're built to move, but we're also built to conserve energy. And the problem we have in the modern world is we've solved one of those problems. Food is freely available everywhere we look, and we've designed cars and other instruments to allow us to get around without uh, expending much energy. The contrary thing, look at what we're all doing here, we should all be standing up. Uh, and we're not doing that. We've designed a world that allows us to sit down. Uh, and a question I often wonder about is how many chairs are in the world? In my office, I have five chairs. Uh, one I sit in and one's for students. Um, there are hundreds of people in my building, so I'm guessing in my building alone there are, I don't know, 5,000 chairs, maybe more. Uh, we, so we, we have done this, we've created this society that allows us to sit around, and we really need, for the sake of our health, to start thinking about uh, engineering a society that allows us to move more. But in your book you talk a lot about the, the effect of walking on creativity and this idea of uh, um, uh, thinking while walking, thinking through walking, um, and uh, you mentioned like some scientists like uh, uh, Hamilton and the Quaternions and so on, but also people probably think of Steve Jobs having walking meetings and so on. Um, but it, can you say a bit more about yeah. this, this creative effect of walking? So uh, if you think about what's happening when you're walking, uh, your, your brain is much more active uh, than when you're sitting down. One of the first problems it has to solve is one of kind of postural adjustment. You have to stand up and you have to maintain balance and get into a kind of a dynamic relationship with the environment. This causes much more of the brain to be active than would otherwise be the case. Uh, and it turns out, with some very simple experiments, you can demonstrate that people who have walked are more creative than people who have been sitting around. So it, this is a, a, one way you can do this, is uh, what's known as the alternative uses test. So you, you bring people to the lab, you get them to sit down at a desk, and you give them common household objects, and you ask them to generate as many uses for those objects as they can. And typically, let's say, for you know, can you come up with 10 uses for a paperclip or whatever it happens to be? Typically, what you see is that people who have been sitting around generate a moderate number of uses. But if you make them walk for 10 minutes before they do this, or get them to walk on a treadmill 
that it doesn't have to be outdoors. Uh, they typically generate about twice as many ideas as they would have done had they just been sitting. But more than this, we also know that this effect of movement obliterates the apparent loss of creativity with aging. Uh, people in their 70s whom you get to move generate more than twice as many ideas as people in their 20s who are sedentary. So the key thing is actually mobilizing more of the brain's resources. And when you're moving around, ideas that would have been kind of lurking at the edges of consciousness now come to threshold. They wouldn't have done uh, so otherwise. And Michael John mentioned the example of, of uh, uh, Sir William Rowe and Hamilton, who invented uh, quaternions, a, a, a really abstruse uh, form of mathematics which finds applications in graphics and uh, the design of your electric toothbrush and all sorts of other uh, domains today. He thought about quaternions every day for years and he used to walk from the, the Astronomical Observatory in North Dublin in Dunsink into Trinity College and one day, having thought about this for a very long time, uh, the idea came to him and he, he, dis he didn't have a pen with him, so he had a, a knife that he used to cut his tobacco with. So he inscribed the equation into a bridge so that he wouldn't forget the equation. And what we have when you, you go back through kind of all, all of these great creatives is uh, walking is central to their creative production. And Immanuel Kant, of course, the, the, the great German philosopher in Konigsberg, you, it was said that you could set the clock by him every day at, at 3 p.m. But what was less realized was when he came back, he would write almost perfect prose for several hours. Bertrand Russell, the, 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 the great philosopher, would do a similar kind of thing. And that book, which I've written there, I dictated a lot of that while walking rather than... Uh, mm. No, it was a horrible mess. Because <laughs> I, I, I'm not as clear a thinker clearly as, as, as they are. But, but it has all of these uh, remarkable benefits. Thanks, and, and I think we, we'll probably come back to the question of how we could kind of rethink and redesign uh, cities, workspaces, and so on uh, to support walking in new ways. But first, I'd like to, to come to Jeffrey. Um, so, Jeffrey, you've gone on a very interesting journey. Uh, you know, I, I've witnessed part of it when we were together in Stanford uh, yeah. more years ago than we care to remember. Uh, and, uh, you know, from motorbike racing uh, and cultural history now to creating robots. You know, what makes a cultural historian get into robots? Well, I think after you break enough bones and win enough plastic trophies, uh, you decide maybe walking is a, a, a more sustainable model of human mobility. Uh, but more seriously, um, I think the whole question of how we leverage the power of tools and technologies that are really at the cutting edge today to support precisely, to leverage the power, these kinds of cognitive capabilities that are so deeply wired into us has become for me really an issue, not just as a cultural historian of cities, but also as a designer and technologist really at the mm -hmm. core. And these slides, which, and I'm going to actually yeah. take yeah. Uh, the prompt I mean, to well, actually maybe, stand maybe, up yeah, and yeah. walk, because yeah, yeah. I'm so deeply peripatetic, whoops, in, in my... You, uh, whoa, you didn't I guess no. that's, there's a monster <laughs> in the room, did you? Yeah. Um, but in my habits, that it's hard for me to think unless I am walking. Uh, just to say a little bit of something. So when we talk about autonomy, walking is the most profound expression of our autonomy, I think, is, as Shane already powerfully suggested. But in the contemporary conversation about mobility, autonomy is an attribute we've been talking about more than anything. Uh, is that better? Okay. Uh, in relation to machines. And so there's two challenges for the future of walking that I see that are... I'm interested in having a conversation with my two peers here. One of them is this vision, this Tomorrowland. This is the 1940 version of that frictionless dream where cities and country, where all of the activities that shape our social and cultural and economic world are shaped around this model of frictionless movement where the automobile is the absolute protagonist of every aspect of the design of the spaces we live in. And we know the consequences of that model. But it, what worries me is that our conversations about Tomorrowland today continue to replay that narrative in many ways, and uh, the, the fulfillment of that model is really a pedestrian-free environment. It's an environment where automotive autonomy is ensured precisely by limiting the mobility of humans, by essentially isolating us even further from one another, instead of leveraging what has been the defining feature of urban spaces throughout the world, uh, 
it, over the course of their history, as we see in Piranesi's image from the mid-18th century of Piazza di Spagna, this promiscuous mixing space that was the sidewalk, the civic square, where transportation vectors are there side by side with animals, with other people, with all kinds of modes of activity. So my question, my addition, my response to the prompt that yeah. Steffi offered us is really let's imagine a walkability-centered model of mobility at the core of the larger picture of a world of cities that we want to live in, not the cities that are handed to us. And as you'll see, this is a, an urban landscape okay. where there are robots. I want to talk about, I'll come back to that, but the second challenge, which is a familiar one to all of us, sometimes referred to as zombieism or, or smartphone zombieism, that when we walk, we don't walk very well today. In the, <laughs> through these connective devices, what we actually do is disconnect from the very spaces, the very environments, the social world that we inhabit on, this, on the sidewalk. And while this is kind of entertaining, what I want to pr promote, what, what I want to add to the conversation is what if there was a category of vehicles that would, could serve as a connective tissue to get us away from our screens and to get us back walking more, walking further, walking better, and especially walking more inclusively, moving more inclusively through those urban spaces that had now been freed from automobiles and brought, made available to us. So the, the object that I'm adding here to the mix here is a robot. This is a carrier robot named Gita. It means a pleasure trip in Italian. Gita is an actual production vehicle. It's on the US market currently. The important thing about it is that it moves at human speeds, and it moves the ways that humans do. Um, it's an electric self-balancing vehicle, and it's a vehicle that has at the core of it a, a cargo bin. It carries stuff. Uh, that's what it does. And how does it operate? Well, it operates incredibly simply. You, you power up, you wake it up, you can open the, power, the, the cargo bin, you can lock it through an app, um, and then all you do is you press a button and it pairs up with you. It locks on to your, the contours of your body. And using its little Godzilla-like nose that sticks out its snout, it is able to scan the environment, engage in forms of object uh, tracking and uh, avoidance. Um, and and that's, that's, that's really it. So why do, you, why do we need a robot, a robotic vehicle, to promote, to augment, to enhance walking as a core feature of human mobility and potentially a core feature of the design of cities in the future. Well, we move around the world with a lot of stuff. This is the major reason why people reach for the keys to the car or for other kinds of devices. That stuff includes stuff we play with, it includes the stuff that we interact with other people with, it includes stuff that we, we drink, we eat, um, but it also includes precious cargo. Would we rather put our precious cargo in a kind of container, in uh, lock them down, or would we rather actually have a tactile relationship to them? I think the answer is clear. So what's different about walking, th this new walking, walking with robots? Well, obviously we use a lot of devices to confront the problem of moving around the, the world with objects. But what's the difference about working with robots is we can leverage the power of a whole range of tools, from AI to machine learning to mach computer vision, to create a rich, completely intuitive model set of interactions of complex behaviors that are fundamentally different than pulling a cart or pushing a cart or carrying a backpack on our backs. Um, it's these micro-adjustments that define a kind of model of human-robot interaction where all of these tools are being used to replicate and reproduce and expand human capabilities rather than to replace them. Um, so what you're seeing here is what we call at Piaggio Fast Forward dynamic following. Jita moves, you don't trigger anything. Your body is the interface. Uh, there is no screen, you're not joysticking the object. It's constantly performing autonomous behaviors triggered by the environment and by how you move through that environment. That's a model of autonomy that strikes me as a really powerful and interesting one. Um, and of course, having your body as the interface means that you can be five years old or 85 years old and operate a robot like this because it's a robot that's human-centered. It's, it's looking at you, it's following you, and it's adapting to the complex etiquette of those civic and social spaces that are our sidewalks, our civic squares, uh, our lobbies, our corridors, and so forth. Machine learning in the service 
of the complexities of these adjustments that, Sean, that Shane was referring to, the way we move with other people, the way we move through obstacles. Those are the challenges that are interesting. And of course, walking with robots is kind of cool. It's really interesting. You go out into the world with, with an object that is untethered to you, that follows you around, and it's a different way of rolling. Whether you're in a wheelchair, you're walking, you're with a cane, uh, a cargo robot like this will follow you, and people have fun with them. This is... So it's a pet you can keep. <laughs> All right. <that's laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. And, and you showed that picture with the baby, but I don't think you're suggesting putting babies inside the, the no, my, no. The, the, our, our house lawyer would kill me if I promoted that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, I mean, I, I think it, it, it's fascinating... Um, uh, this idea of companionship, and, and it's almost like a combination between a, a pet, you know, which, I mean, we all know how pets encourage us to walk, right? Uh, um, uh, but uh, this is also, you know, it's between a pet and a, a luxury accessory. Uh, like, I mean, is this just a, a $3,000 handbag uh, in new form? Well, it, it, it starts life as a kind of proposition, an object that enters the world that hopefully reinforces the ability for people to think differently about the future of urban design, yeah. uh, neighborhood design, town design. But, um, but you know, it's, a, it's really meant as a kind of catalyst for, yeah. for a rethinking about how we create a kind of hierarchy of mobility forms that reestablishes yeah. walking as the foundation stone. Yeah. Um, and I think what we often forget is, is that even however fundamental walking is, it's, uh, and however under pressure it is, that there are large categories of society, especially as our societies age, that really struggle with these mm -hmm. mobility issues. And carrying stuff is at the core of those struggles. Mm -hmm. So I see it as a first step towards a future mm -hmm. where walkability is not just a real estate virtue, but yeah. uh, a virtue that's fundamental to our notion of civic space. Mm. But it, uh, let's, let's talk about space and about uh, how one would go about redesigning uh, cities, workplaces uh, to support walking. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd be interested in both of your views on that. Yeah. Maybe Shane to start. Yes, so there's a, there's a lot of things to say, many of them very controversial, especially... The microphone. Oh, yeah. Sorry, nope. there's a lot of things to say, <laughs> and many of them very controversial. Um, you know, uh, if we look at the car as part of our lives, it's only been a, an experiment that we've been running for about the last 100 years. Uh, cars became a big thing, I guess, in the, in the, the 1920s. Um, but we're now at the stage, especially in the, the kind of the old medieval cities of Europe, where we're continuing to attempt to pour litres into the, the half litre that is our, <laughs> our city centre. We can't do this anymore. And if, if we look at the things that make our cities places that people want to be, um, the places, the spaces that uh, we want to go to are not car-oriented spaces. You know, so yeah, yeah, I invite you uh, to look at uh, the, the best tourist attractions in Munich. I guarantee you none of them will be any of the motorways around the edges of, of the city. They will be civic spaces that people can gather together, have coffee, talk to each other, they can look at shops, these kinds of things. And those spaces actually, paradoxically, are economically intensive spaces as well as socially intensive spaces because mm. these are the kinds of places and, uh, that humans naturally gravitate towards. And this is true for any city that you care to go to. The places that people want to go to are places where other people want to go to. We do not want to go to the ring road around the city. We, <laughs> uh, but we've decided to impose that kind of peripheral transport on the center of our cities. So I think a challenge for the next uh, 20, 30 years will be the progressive banning of cars in our cities uh, the reclaiming of roads uh, as spaces for humans to walk on, the uh, dramatic extension of footpaths, and uh, also something we haven't talked about much, uh, the engagement in micromobility um, in, in terms of scooters and also in terms of, of uh, bicycles. And some of the cities of Europe are making a great stride where this is concerned. I think uh, Amsterdam is, is, is particularly good. I think, uh, I, I, I hope I don't sound uh, too controversial here, but I think the Danish example in Copenhagen has been oversold because uh, there's a whacking great motorway that runs up the, the middle of, of uh, Copenhagen, which is very distressing for a walker to try and, and, and get across. But the, the parts of Copenhagen that have been pedestrianized and made safe for cyclists are, are really, really quite wonderful. So the, we have a lot of things to think about. Um, and we haven't started that job yet. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey? I, I, I would just add, I, I think this very important point that Shane just touched upon, it's not about 
just replacing one vector with another vector. It's about constru building a new mobility ecology. And I think different forms of micromobility will, in my view, be at the core of that. There will be a role, I think, for automobiles in certain environments on certain scales, but we can no longer sacrifice our cities or the quality of life in our cities and towns on the altar of automobility. I think that's a 20th century model of development that we have lived through the consequences of. So I think part of that process involves also recovering the large amount of territory, very expensive urban terrain that we've handed over to automobiles. It's maybe worth reminding people that the percentage of urban space typically used just for storage of automobiles, not automobiles in usage, but storage, parking, uh, is somewhere in the range by most estimates of 10 to 15 percent. In some cities, it's closer to 20 percent. Uh, that's a very big loss of valuable space, whether it's for social interaction, cultural interaction, or for the quality of uh, the, the, the lives led by uh, by the inhabitants of our towns and cities. Um, I would like to give a chance for a couple of questions from the audience, if people have questions. Um, and while you're thinking of your question, I'd just like to ask uh, you guys, I mean, one of the things that you talk about in your book, Shane, a lot is the benefits of walking in natural surroundings. Uh, uh, and, you know, the, we've seen the emergence of things like the park prescription, where people are prescribed to go to parks for... Uh, mental health reasons. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a bit more about this topic and how it relates to both of your work? Yeah, so again, there's, there, there's a little doubt where humans are concerned. You know, there's this wonderful hypothesis, the, the biophilic uh, hypothesis, uh, that humans need regular exposure to, uh, to nature. And if you track patterns of, of human behavior these days, uh, just reflecting on what Jeffrey has said, uh, humans are now living in towns and cities. The majority of the planet lives in an urban environment. We spend typically 85, 90% of our time indoors, not with the wind and rain on our face, not with the sun on our, uh, on our eyes. Uh, and we evolved though in a, in a landscape that was full of sensory stimulation provided for us by nature. And we are particularly attuned to that. And we know from both naturalistic studies and from experimental studies that giving people exposure to nature uh, really has a marked effect on how they uh, feel. One simple study, and we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll just mention it by Ulrich in the US uh, a number of years ago, looked at people who were randomly assigned to hospital beds that had a view out of, uh, a, 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 of a tree and a natural environment or a blank wall. The people who had the view of nature healed more quickly, they were given uh, less pain medicine, they spent less time in hospital, all of those kinds of things. Whereas the people randomly assigned to the bed beside them for the same operation spent longer in hospital and complained more. Um, so exposure to nature really has a marked effect on us. Thank you, Shane. We just have time for one question. I see somebody over here. Uh, if you could shout. Uh, <laughs> Very quickly, guys. Uh, yeah. uh, we need to redesign our buildings so that people can move around. In my, in my building, there's a lift in front of me when you come in the door, not the stairs. And I would add to that, one of the really exciting thresholds here that's being crossed is vehicles like Jita, which I, I see as just one gesture in this direction, are vehicles that operate indifferently in outdoor and indoor environments. So we can start to really rethink what a facade is of a building and the porosity between the built environment and the natural environment in ways that really open up some interesting new horizons for what a neighborhood looks like, what a workplace looks like. I think that redesign process is really what this conversation is all about. Final question for both of you. What are you adding? <laughs> <laughs> I'm adding by subtracting. No, I want to subtract cars from our cities. <laughs> So making things like yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm working with Shane to add a vehicle that supports that subtraction process. Right, great. <laughs> well, so I would like to invite you, please don't become sea squirts. Uh, don't eat your own brains through sedentary activity. But let's go out there and stop talking the talk. Let's walk the walk. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. <laughs>